Hello everybody, uh, thanks for the invitation to the ML Retrospective Workshop. My name is Kieran Weinberger, I'm from Cornell University and from ASAP Research. And I would like to talk about the importance of deconstruction. And let me start with a quote, a famous quote that you've all heard of from Otto von Bismarck, to retain, to retain a respect for sausages and laws, one must not watch them in the making. And I've long thought that you could actually say the same thing about machine learning papers. And so what I thought as well when I got the invitation to this workshop, well, maybe at this workshop, I should actually talk about how the sausage is being made. And in fact, what I'm planning to do is talk about three different papers that are all from my lab <coughs> and where essentially I will tell you the details that led to that paper that are not in the write-up at the end. So how do they come about, the process, and so on. And so they seemingly have nothing in common with each other, but what you may discover is at the end, or hope you will discover, is that actually there's a common thread to how we approach the problems. All right, so let's start with the first one, simple black box adversary attacks. It was an ICML paper in 2019, last year. The setting is very simple. Basically, in Zegg et al. in 2013, discovered that if you take an image and you classify this, even if that image gets classified correctly with very high probability, <clears throat> very high confidence, you can make very small imperceptible changes, imperceptible to a human, to make it essentially be classified as anything else. So here we have an image of an eel. You can make very small changes. These are the changes. We add them to the image. You can't tell the difference. And now the neural network, with very high confidence, classifies it as goldfish. Actually, it's not really anything to do with neural networks. It's really a property of machine learning algorithm in general. But this the setting gives rise to a nice or interesting search problem. That's the following. Given an image you know, of an eel, in this case, or anything, uh, given a target label, how do I find the trajectory? How do I find the changes that I need to make to the original image such that it you know, basically becomes this image with imperceptible changes that now gets misclassified? So how can I find this new image that's almost the same, but it fools a classifier? Well, if you have a white box attack, that's really easy. What's a white box attack? Uh, white box means the classifier I'm trying to fool is known to me and I have full access to it. So in this case, it's a neural network. I can run it. I know exactly what it is. And if I have such access to it, I can just push the, neural, the image through it, get my output, and then I can clamp the output to goldfish and do a gradient descent with respect to that loss. And the gradient that I'm getting is essentially what I can add to the image. So this is really, really simple. I'll just do backprop, essentially, if it's a neural network. And that's already in the original paper by Zeg Dilal. It's a lot harder when it's a black box attack. Black box attack means I'm trying to attack an algorithm that I don't know what it is, how it works. I have no access to it other than I can run images through it and get the output. So think of, for example, the Google API. Right? You can upload an image, you get the predictions, you have to pay for it, but you don't know what exactly they're using, etc. There's many, many papers that have attacked this problem, the black box adversary attacks. And essentially, the way they work is they all use very similar, mostly use similar approaches, but they probe many different directions and to approximate the gradient, very similar to a white box attack. And then once you get the gradient, you add that to the image. The downside, though, is here's the number of queries that you need to be successful. You need many, in the order of thousands of queries for this to be successful. And then, of course, you get easily detected and so on. So what we thought ourselves is, well, is there a way to do black box adversary attacks without approximating the gradients? Because we found that approximating the gradients is very, very expensive. And the reason we also asked this question is because we had a good idea how to do it. And that was we wanted to take the black box and approximate it with another machine learning algorithm that we have control over. And so in particular, what we thought of, we use a Gaussian process. Um, my students, Jake and Jeff, they came up with this GPyTorch, which is a library for Gaussian processes that allows you to very, very efficiently code up these, these Gaussian processes. So in some sense, we had all the tools to, to make this, you know, do this very easily. And they're very excited about it. So the idea is we take an image, we can make perturbations to it, we push it to the black box, and then we get some output, and we observe that output, and then we feed this 
these outputs into a Gaussian process to basically, you know, give tell us for a certain pixel, here yeah, this kind of is the, the pixel, for a certain pixel, what is the impact of it? Like how much is that gonna get us towards, you know, the gradient label? And the cool thing is with Gaussian processes, this thing called Bayesian optimization, um, where essentially what we're doing is we're kind of probing different locations. And these are locations that basically are, could possibly or are likely to be the most promising next direction that I would like to probe. That's essentially the idea. So you're kind of trading off um, exploration and exploitation. So you're trying to learn a lot about this black box. On the other hand, you're also trying to find its vulnerabilities. So we thought it's a beautiful story. You know, we have all the tools for it. You can just write this paper. It's really, really cool. So we implemented it and it turns out it worked like a charm. Like first try, it worked beautifully. Um, we needed fewer, I don't know the exact number of probes we needed, queries we needed, but it was fewer than the state of the art. My students were super excited. Right, this is really, really cool. This is gonna make a great NeurIPS paper. We have beautiful math, beautiful derivations, all this Gaussian process, image prior stuff, exploration, exploitation, trade-off, and so on. And at the end, we have great numbers. What else do you want? But then we thought about this for a second, and we were like, well, wait a second, right? So previously, people did this, approximated the gradients, right? And they had many algorithms how to do this, but it turns out you don't actually need the gradients, right? And so now we use this Bayesian optimization, and we have a great algorithm to do this, but maybe we're making the same mistake. Maybe you don't actually need Bayesian optimization, right? Maybe we are all thinking too complicated. Why don't we, you know, just add, think of like, what's what would be a baseline that doesn't do any of this? What's the simplest baseline possible? And the more we thought about it, so we took our approach and we deconstructed it. We tried to move, take away components until we had nothing left. And we came up with this, we thought, well, if you don't have a model, if you have nothing, then there's only one thing you can do. You can pick a random pixel. And so that's the algorithm we came up with. So basically what you do is you take an image, you pick a random pixel, this red pixel here, and you pick a random color, red, and you increase that color a little bit by epsilon. And now you take that perturbed image and push it to the black box. And if the probability of your target label goldfish is higher, then you accept that change and you move to the next pixel. If it's not, if it's then you take the opposite. You take the same pixel, same color, but you decrease its value. You get an output. If that is now closer to your target label, go, go, uh, goldfish in this case, you accept that change. And if it's also not closer, then you just pick a random new pixel. That's all there is to it. So basically you just pick a random pixel, you perturb it a little, and you see if that change has a design output. If not, you do the opposite change. And then you try another pixel over and over again. The whole algorithm is a few lines of Python code. It's ridiculously easy. Right? We ran it, and my students came to my office and were like, it works. And in fact, it worked much better than the Bayesian optimization approach, and it worked better than anything else. So now we had a dilemma, right? We had this, what well, we had discovered an algorithm that's so trivial that we can't write anything about it, right? There's no interesting math, there's nothing. You know, the algorithm is just five lines, right? <clears throat> it's trivial, but it works really, really well. So my students were a little disappointed. But actually, the more we thought about it, we realized that, no, it's not the algorithm that's the interesting part. What's interesting is what we understood about the problem, that actually the problem is really, really easy. And the algorithm is the proof that this is really, really easy. Essentially, what's, what's going on here is that the space is such that if you have an original image and you like to perturb it, Actually, it doesn't matter which direction you pick, right? Pretty much any random direction is a direction that leads you to one of these adversarial images with the right label. And because this is the case, you can actually, you know, construct this very simple algorithm and be successful with it. This is a much more important insight than yet another approach to do adversarial images. It really tells you something about the problem as a whole, right? That the reason there were so many papers on it and so many people had, you know, different ways of finding this is because actually the problem is really, really easy and pretty much anything you do works. And that's the paper we published in ICML 2019. Let me talk about the second paper. The second paper is about 3D object detection with stereo images and we published it at CBPR 2019. 3D object detection, essentially the problem is you've given a scene and with cars and objects in it and you're trying to 
put a bounding box around objects of a certain type. So for example, cars. As you can imagine, that's a very important problem in uh, self-driving cars. So for example, Waymo and Uber and Tesla and so on, they all try to solve this problem. Now it turns out there's two different approaches. One is what Waymo and Uber and Lyft are doing, and one is what Tesla is doing. Waymo, Uber, and Lyft, those are all LiDAR-based approaches. So they have to take a car, they put a LiDAR on top. And what's a LiDAR? A LiDAR is, um, is a laser that spins around and sends out these laser light pulses. And essentially what you're doing is you're measuring the time from the time when you send it out until it comes back. And then given the speed of light as a constant, you can compute the distance of that object, of the, of the reflection point. LiDAR gives you very, very precise. It's an active sensor. It gives you very precise point clouds. And it's very good for this kind of task. Tesla decided not to go down that route. They just put down cameras because you know LiDARs are very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, they stick out in the top, have a high track coefficient. It's bad for elect electric cars. And they also look kind of ugly. So um, Elon Musk basically decided to just ship cars with stereo cameras and uh, hoped he would f you know, figure out how to do this with just stereo images. The press mostly ridiculed him for this decision, basically saying that if you don't do LiDAR, you're wrong. Um, he was also very outspoken about the fact that he doesn't like LiDAR. So let's take a step back and think, you know, I just want to explain to you how this works. And it's actually, on a high level, it's very simple. So basically, you have your, if you have LiDAR, you just have your LiDAR point cloud, and that's from a bird eye view. So you kind of, despite that the car is here and you're kind of looking out, you kind of present the whole thing as a point cloud from above. Then you have the frontal images, you put that into a neural network, and out come these proposal uh, bounding boxes. If you have stereo, you actually have a two pipeline approach. The first one is you just take stereo images and you um, compute the disparity map. So the disparity map test, if I have two images of the same scene, but the cameras are apart from each other, then every single pixel and pixel, matching pixels are a little bit apart from each other. That's the disparity. And given the disparity map and the focal length of the uh, camera and the distance of the camera, I can do a little bit of physics, it's just a simple equation, and compute a depth map. And now I take the RGBD, the red, green, uh, RGBD um, uh, image. So basically, I have the colors, and I also have the depth for every single pixel. And I stick that into an object detector, and out come the box, uh, objects. Now, why did everybody make fun of Elon Musk? It's because this approach didn't work. Right? So here is the kitty benchmark data set. Here we have um, easy, moderate, and hard examples. Um, and you can see LiDAR has very high accuracy, whereas stereo, very low accuracy. In fact, this on the left-hand side, the plot defines a hit when you have 50% overlap with the ground truth. Here, you have to have 70% of the overlap. And that's actually, you look at these numbers, right? Just 9% of the time or 8% of the time. So would you really get into a car that detects other cars just 9% of the time? It doesn't work. The question is, why doesn't it work? And we thought about this. And at the time, everybody believed the reason it doesn't work, there's this huge discrepancy, is that essentially LiDAR is so laser super accurate, versus stereo cameras are just not. Right? They're very inaccurate passive sensors, so there's LiDAR is an active sensor. And you know, it's, it's basically the you know, physical limitation. But we looked at these depth maps, and we thought they're actually pretty good. And so my student Jan and a few other students in my lab, you know, sat down and tried to make it work with a depth map. And essentially what they did is they tried to look at, well, try to come up with components from the, basically the conjecture was that these neural networks that are used for um, uh, point class, but for LiDAR points are much better than the ones for images. So they tried to uh, steal ideas in some sense from the point cloud neural networks. Um, and uh, use them on images. And so they came up with a super cool Superman network. I forgot what the name was. It came up, it has a whole bunch of components that basically takes the depth map and frontal images in and predicts these boxes. But different from our prior work, it actually worked. It worked really, really well. Right? 
And <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the detail of what exactly they did, but um, you know, look at these improvements, right? From nine percent to some, you know, really high improvement. So my students were super excited, right? And we had something really, really cool. This will be a guaranteed CVPR exec, right? With a new network architecture, right? A lot of interesting components. Um, we had amazing results, right? Hands down, this is a slam dunk. But we thought about it. And we're like, well, if the gains are so big, right? These are unprecedented gains, right? Never before in this this problem domain have you seen such huge jumps in accuracy. We should really understand where they're coming from. And so what we did is we took this architecture that my students came up with and took it apart, right? And really tried to every single component and said, what does it do? What if we change every single thing and so on? And what we realized is that essentially there was one component that was absolutely crucial. And that was some pre-processing step that basically took the depth map that before it was a frontal image and just had the depth for every single pixel and converted it to a bird's eye view point cloud. That's a trivial transformation, right? It's just basically saying you have the x, y coordinate and you have the z coordinate, right? <clears throat> x, y comes from the pixel and z is basically the depth, right? And now you have, you just take this here and make a, for every single pixel you make a point in the point cloud and you just rotate it, but it, you look at it from above. The reason that was necessary was to integrate it with some of the components that some of the ideas we had from the light, you know, we took from the LiDAR community. And because that was so crucial, we thought, well, what if we only use that component, right? So essentially what we're doing is we just take the depth map, we just take this representation and convert it to a 3D point cloud from above, and now stick this into a LiDAR neural network, the state-of-the-art neural network. Now, the important thing is at this point, we've removed all, you know, except the, all our innovations, except this little 3D transformation, right? Going from stereo images to disparity map was already done. We took an off-the-shelf network. And then we made this little transformation from depth map to what we call pseudo LiDAR, the, to a point cloud in bird eye view. And then we took the an object rec uh, recognition network that was already published in state of the art. Turns out that worked really well. So now the problem was we had these really, really good results, right? Much better than anybody else, massive improvements. But our only contribution was a 3D transformation, not even, it was just a rep representation of basically saying, well, we take the, the depth of every single pixel, and instead of adding it as a channel, we basically input every single point as a bird eye view, you know, point cloud. <clears throat> so the question is, that's still publishable, right? So the algorithm at this point was trivial, but we had a very profound insight and a very important insight, and that was the following, that these depth maps, right, the reason previously it was so hard to get stereo image object recognition to work was not because it was so inaccurate, it was because these depth maps was just really badly suited for neural networks. If you convert it to pseudo LiDAR, this is a much better representation, and I can tell you why. Because if you do a little bit of blurring here, imagine you blur this pixel with that pixel, what happens? You deform, right? You blur this here, you actually get some depth that's between the car and the background. The background is really far away, so you're deforming this car, and you can no longer recognize that object. But convolutional neural networks blur things all the time. That's what their filters are doing, right? So that's, that's essentially the problem. Like this is kind of a terrible representation for, for neural networks. So what we did is <clears throat> we had this new conjecture and we wrote the paper about exactly this. That essentially you should use pseudo LiDAR representation when you do 3D depth estimation from cameras. And once again, instead of actually having yet another complicated algorithm, we had a profound insight about this problem, right? And Essentially, that is you know, what most people are using now for 3D object detection, or maybe all of them, I don't know. I, I know for sure that Tesla uh, at least has mentioned in their developer conference that they are now using pseudo LiDAR for their pipeline internally. All right, last but not least, few shot learning. So few shot learning is a setup where um, during test time, you give an image of one particular class, for example, one cat image, and you're supposed to come up with a cat classifier. 
dog and you're supposed to come up with a dog classifier. But during training, you don't see any of those objects. You see images of different objects, but many, many of them. So you see maybe many tigers, many zebras, many, many elephants. But during testing, you see completely new classes and you're supposed to quickly build a classifier. This is something that I've worked on during my thesis, actually, 2007, when we developed the triplet loss. And so I was excited to go back to it because back then no one really, you know, there wasn't a lot of interest in, this, in these kind of problems, but now there's a lot of interest in this problem. And so my friend Lawrence van der Martin and I and my students came up with this really cool idea. We thought, well, why don't we use error correcting output codes? That's something that people have all but forgotten about, forgotten about. And because we have these very few data points, we could actually use these error correcting output codes. The way this works is for every single class during test time, essentially you, you create a binary code, like a 0, 0, 1, it's random, you just make a random code. And then for each bit, you train a classifier. So here dog and cat are 0, and hamster and ferret are 1. So you create this data set, dog, cat 0, hamster, ferret 1, and train a classifier. And then you have a test point, you stick it through these classifiers, you get a new, new uh, binary, vector for this test point and you do nearest neighbor classifier. That was our idea. And we thought it was really, really cool. So we implemented it and it worked really, really well. In fact, you know, we blew everybody else away. We were so excited. What a cool algorithm. What happened then is we thought about, well, where exactly do these gains come from? What is important? How big should these error codes be, etc. So we took it all apart. We looked into, we, we added more of these binary codes, we added fewer of these binary codes, you know, we took different linear classifiers, we added more regularization and so on. And very quickly we realized, no matter what we did, the performance was essentially the same. So then we removed the linear classifiers, just the random projections, it all worked exactly the same. We removed the error correcting output codes altogether and at the end all we had left was just we had to take the input, put it through the neural network, you know, the feature extractor, and then we just do nearest neighbor. That's it. And that's when we realized that the only reason we got these good results was not because of the error correcting output codes, the stuff that we were so excited about. No, it was just that we used nearest neighbors. And we did a simple pre-processing actually. We used the cosine distance, which makes a lot of sense in this space. And because everything is positive, because you, after ReLU, or the error correcting output codes are all non-zero, we subtracted the mean and we normalized the features. And if you do that in itself, you actually at the time, we could beat every single paper that was out there, pretty much every paper that was out there. Now, that was so trivial that we didn't know how to write a paper about it. So we wrote a tech report about it, um, <clears throat> and we called it Simple Shot. But it's a tech report I'm very proud of because, actually, it says something very, very profound. Right? Despite that there's many, many, many papers, there were so many papers out there on few shot learning, and we almost made the mistake of adding yet another paper to this, telling people that they should use error correcting output code, output codes would have been total nonsense, right? Instead, what we, what we told the community was actually this problem is really, really easy. And in fact, most of the gains probably came from the fact that these neural networks got better and better and people just had better features. And what classifier you use afterwards, all this future learning, just use nearest neighbors, right? That's a really, really strong baseline. And the people, the reason people probably didn't discover that earlier is because they didn't normalize the features properly and didn't subtract the mean, which is something you have to do if you use cosine similarity. All right, so turns out at this point you should hopefully see that there's some kind of system to this madness. Um, actually, most of my papers follow this kind of theme, right? That, <coughs> But you basically come up with something complicated and then we try to deconstruct it. So in 2019, we had a paper on simplifying graph convolution in your network. And we showed that actually there's a very simple approximation to GCNs, but actually most of the time works just as well. And it's just a linear classifier. Or in 2017, we had an ICML paper. The story here, again, was we tried to come up with a way to calibrate the outputs of neural networks. We had a really cool algorithm based on stochastic depth where you drop layers and so on. But then what we realized is there was this very simple baseline plat scaling, this variant of plat scaling that works really, really well. And so what we did is we published a paper about this baseline, essentially saying calibration 
there's a very there's a reason why new networks are not calibrated is because they overfit to the loss to get overconfident if you just recalibrate them you essentially can undo this <clears throat> all right so in conclusion let me have one more one more quote by albert einstein everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler and this comes from one of the greatest physicists of all time and in physics and in biology and life sciences this is very obvious right so essentially what people are doing is they have some something they try to discover and that's typically some alien technology right like in biology there will be the human cell right the human cell was not made by humans it's made by some alien some some evolutionary process or you know who knows right or the universe is made by you know alien is just something that's not human here in this case and you're trying to understand this so what you do is you conduct experiments you try to simplify it until you have some insights you kind of reduce the outputs of that experiments into this insight and that's what you write your paper about in machine learning we don't really have that right instead we have a problem and we're trying to solve that problem and we're kind of in between engineering and science here, right? So first you want to solve the problem. So what do people do is they come up with increasingly complicated machines. You kind of tweak your machine, make it more and more complex, right? Add stuff to it, try this, try that, until you get good results, right? Once you have good results, you're super excited. And what I unfortunately see a lot is that people then write a paper about it. And also sometimes that is necessary, very often it's not. And in some sense, the reason I'm giving this talk is because I would like to urge the community to kind of back away from this a little bit. And one thing I've been enforcing in my lab very strictly is to try very hard not to write these papers, even if it's hard for the students. <clears throat> what I really, what I think is really, really important is to have a second phase of deconstruction. That you actually then say, okay, well, I found something that works. Now I'm a scientist. Right? So this first part was the engineer. I'm trying to build something that works. But now I'm putting in my scientist head and you know, I'm listening to Einstein. I'm saying, well, what is the simplest possible solution that actually gives me the same effect? Right? And I'm deconstructing the complicated machine. Come with something really, really simple. And sometimes this really, really simple thing is not interesting in its own right. Like, you know, for example, in Simple Shot, it was just nearest neighbors, right? Or in, you know, uh, Simba, it was just a random direction, right? But the fact that that works gives you a lot of insight about the problem. And that is what ultimately makes a, you know, in my eyes, a very interesting paper. Of course, the paper doesn't write this whole path, right? In the paper, you just write about the problem, the insight, and the simple solution. And... You know, usually you don't talk about how the sausage is made. This is, by the way, a tofu sausage because I'm vegetarian. <clears throat> and so finally, just to wrap things up, what I'm, you know, hoping, uh, hoping that I convinced you of is that uh, what we should do as a community is to strive for simplicity instead of complexity. And it's very tempting to add complexity to a problem to get better results. But... That's good. And sometimes there can be a means to an end to understand or get the good results, see what works, right? Add stuff until it works. That's the engineering part. But then don't be afraid to deconstruct your finding. Don't worry, even if you make it trivial, right? Because ultimately, once you have a trivial solution, that's when you really understand a problem or a simple solution. And the most interesting papers in my eyes are the ones that write something, a new understanding about a problem. Those, you know, I hope those are the papers that stay around. And um, I would thank my students who actually, you know, help, you know, did uh, Lawrence Van Martin here and some faculty, Farad and Mark. And <coughs> these students had to listen a lot of me kind of deconstruct, you know, forcing them to re deconstruct it. Often they've, they've done it by themselves and done a lot of amazing work. And thank you very much for listening.